Okay, good morning. Uh, I think we'll wait for one or two minutes before we start. Okay, so good morning. Uh, let me start uh, with the first lecture today. Can anyone unmute and tell me if the slides are visible? Yes, sir, they are visible. Okay, thank you. So uh, today I'm going to give you the introductory lecture of IT468, natural computing. Uh, and this is a very, very uh, important topic 
it's an emerging area in computer science or you can say in ICT in general uh, and uh, it, it has a lot of opportunities for young people to pursue even a career uh, because uh, there are many emerging technologies where you can actually develop something you know or learn something this is the future uh, of computer science you know and it is closely related to the nature you know so that's why it's called as natural computing so uh, you will learn uh, in this course that how nature is doing computer science you know and uh, okay the, so this slide here actually is the uh, you know it's a campus uh, beautiful campus that you can see of DICT so I hope some of you are missing it because you are at home but uh, uh, at some point you may visit uh, i hope uh, you may visit soon by the way uh, please stop me at any point by unmuting yourself if you want to ask any question you know so first of all i would like to thank uh, the ICT and many of my students you know, almost 250 students who have helped me in this area till now. Uh, I would like to also thank Eric Winfrey of Caltech, John Rice at Duke University, Paul Ottman at Caltech, Ned Seaman at Purdue, Ashish Gore at Stanford, Sean Douglas at University of California, San Francisco, Pengin at Harvard, and Sidney Sau, who was at uh, who did his PhD with John Rice at uh, Duke. Now he's in the industry. Uh, I'm also thankful to some of the other people uh, from where, where I have taken some graphics, uh, you know, which is available in the public domain. So thanks to those who created it. Okay. Okay. So uh, now, if you look at uh, what is the philosophy here, uh, if, you know, if you know, if you look at the at the bottom. It is written laboratory of natural information processing. So this is the philosophy of natural information processing. So how the nature does information processing, uh, and this is a key thing to understand. So that's how in our lab, uh, if you see that uh, at the top there is a classical computer which is zero and one, so it's doing information processing. At the bottom there is a quantum computer because there is a string of qubits which is doing uh, you know information processing. And in the middle, there is a DNA which is doing information processing as well. Uh, you know, so we are uh, we will be focusing more on DNA in this course, but of course, uh, there are many other uh, dimensions. Uh, you know, and if you see this picture at the middle, uh, this is a famous picture uh, appeared in 2006 at the Nature front cover, and this was the work by Paul Rotman, uh, uh, and you know, of what is known as DNA origami. So you know, you know that origami is a Japanese art for folding paper. So uh, Paul Rotman uh, and his group has folded the paper uh, rather than folding a paper. They use DNA, you know, and they fold it into this smiley face. So it's a very famous picture, you know. So I hope uh, you can do these things. Actually, now we have developed the softwares through which you can do. In fact, in our lab, uh, we have developed many softwares, uh, you know, uh, and you, we are going to learn some of those things, uh, how to do this. Of course, these experiments you can do, uh, you know, I think uh, in nearby places like IIT Gandhinagar, there is a, uh, Dr. Dhiraj Bhatia who can help you in doing these experiments. They are, you know, so uh, we focus in our lab mainly on theoretical aspects and, uh, you know, the software aspects and the experiments uh, we don't do, but of course, we rely on other, many other people. So. For example, uh, some of our experiments were done at National uh, Center for Biological Sciences, uh, TIFR Bangalore, uh, uh, done by Dr. Taslim Arif. And, uh, and one of our collaborators in Fraunhofer, uh, Dr. David Smith uh, in Germany, they have done some of our experiments, you know. So uh, there are partners who can do the experiments uh, for us. But so we focus on theory, theory, new ideas, and how to do the, you know, uh, software business, you know. So we have our own. Uh, 11 softwares released in this area and so most of them are done by you know developed by the students like you you know in the class uh, they were doing some projects and then that resulted in a software okay so I have divided lecture into a couple of parts so first I will talk about the administrative details 
uh, and then I'll give you also overview of the subject classification. Okay, and uh, I'll also talk about the historical introduction and motivation, uh, why this field is there, a general overview. And in fact, uh, if you look at uh, this picture here, uh, what is written here? Can you can you read it? Anyone can read read it for me. This here, this picture. What is written? Hello, hello world, right? So hello world is the first computer program that you write actually, right? Whenever you are learning a programming language, and it turns out that you know this is done by undergraduate students in 2004. They have used bacteria, the real bacteria. To write hello world, you know, so it's kind of bacterial programming, right? You can program bacteria. In fact, bacteria are very, very wonderful thing, uh, uh, very full, very wonderful microbes, and you can do uh, a lot of uh, wonderful things. Uh, you know, there are a lot more bacteria on this planet, you know, uh, and I, in fact, there are a couple of estimates as well. And I would say that these bacteria uh, are the ones who rule this planet, you know, right from ocean uh, you know current formation in the ocean to many other things you know you know all the digestion of your food or, or whatsoever so i will show you some uh, you know in the next one or two slides i will talk more about bacteria uh, how, how they are doing things i mean how you can do art with bacteria you, know, you see so you look at this this is bacterial art uh, these are the flowers created by bacteria. These are the living bacteria in the lab. You can do that. You know, this is the picture of a human, right? And I think this Professor Jacob at Israel, he was very famous in this area. He has promoted this uh, bacterial art quite a lot. Uh, now he is no more actually, but uh, he has done a lot of work actually. You can find a lot of papers, a lot of other things that he created uh, using uh, bacterial art. Okay, so. This is a nice thing, but I will I will tell you something about India also. Uh, in this competition uh, last year, December 2020, you see this peacock was created by Indian team in South India. You know, so they've used microbes. Uh, so this, I mean, so this competition is organized by American Society for Microbiology. It's the annual agar, agar art competition. Uh, so they created this. This these are the real bacteria, live bacteria, which have created this art. You see, so with bacteria, you can create art. So rather than paint and brush, uh, you know, so this is something really nice. How complex a thing you can create by, by an art. So, so I'm motivating this class by starting with an, uh, some examples from art side of it, so bacterial art. But of course, there are some many, many more serious things that are possible to do with uh, these things. Okay. Uh, so I think now I will focus on the admin administrative details about the course, uh, you know, in a couple of slides, four or five slides maybe, and then we'll talk about the historical motivation. Any question at this point? Okay. Okay. So I think uh, uh, there are. Uh, uh, you know, you see there is a Leela Kari in the picture and uh, uh, Rosenberg. Uh, so these, are, these are purely computer scientists, especially I would say the theoretical computer scientists, you know. They have done a lot of work in this area. And uh, uh, there is a nice handbook of natural computing, you know. So as the course is known as natural computing, so there is a nice handbook of natural computing. I will talk about more about the literature, you know, uh, towards the end of the lecture uh, where I will give you some links. and. This nice uh, book, uh, Handbook of Unconventional Computing, is about to come probably in November or something uh, in two volumes. And Handbook of Unconventional Computing is in also two volumes. You see, this these two books uh, have plenty of uh, examples from nature and the directions, actually, you can see in the natural computing. There is a nice uh, paper uh, written by uh, Leela Kari uh, in Canada. Uh, the Many Faces of Natural Computing in, com appeared in communications of the ACM, you know. Which you can give, which will give you some nice, you know, overview of the area. Of course, it is a bit old now, uh, and plenty of things have happened since then. But it's still, it's a good start, I would say. And uh, you know, there is also this book, Computation in Living Cells. You know, uh, how living cells can do computation. You know, so basically, what is natural computing? So natural computing builds a bridge between computer science and natural science. You know? So this is a key idea. Uh, <laughs> I will talk more about it. Okay. So, 
computer science you already know and natural sciences like life sciences uh, it has a lot of other things uh, okay this is something about our about me actually uh, google classroom link is there youtube channel you can subscribe so that you can get updates uh, the lab uh, address is there guptalab.org twitter you can follow uh, anyway so this is the basic thing about me so lecture timings you know uh, 8 30 to 9 45 tuesday and 10 8, 10 15 to 11 30 a.m on friday okay uh marks distribution or tentative grading policy uh assignment is 10 percent midterm 30 percent one midterm scribe notes uh, you know scribe notes are basically you need to write Based on the lectures, you need to prepare notes and submit the notes. You know, you can work in a group of two, three, whatever, and submit these things. And finally, you can do a project. So I think projects will be uh, uh, really interesting thing for you uh, because you can see, you can learn many things, you know, in the project itself, you know, something very, very important. Any question for the grading policy? Uh, I think because many students have some doubts about the grading policy. Any question about the grading policy? Okay, so okay, so finally, uh, let me start. So I'll start with this motivational quote by Edelman. Edelman is a famous computer scientist, as you know. He got the Turing Award, and uh, you know uh, he has uh, done. I mean, he's very famous for RSA Kripal system. You know, Revis, Shamir, and Edelman. You know, Professor Revis was a professor at MIT. Shamir was also there, uh, who is from Israel, and Edelman. You know, these three people actually. Uh, created RSA crypto system and you know something around 1978 and you know after that uh, if, uh, you know so most of the banking whenever you whenever you are logging into your internet account in, or banking account uh, so RSA crypto system is working at the back end you know so those things were invented by him and uh, him and his colleagues and actually a, in a very interesting thing so something let me tell you about this uh, DNA computing uh, you know, the idea that uh, DNA can compute, or basically you can find a computer inside uh, biology, was very old. But uh, in, around 1987, uh, Tom Tom had uh, actually showed that splicing operation. Whenever uh, you know inside our body, uh, there is a phenomenon known as uh, central dogma of biology, where uh, you know information flows from DNA to RNA and RNA to protein. You know. So in between, there is a process known as splicing process. And he has shown that a splicing process is equivalent to clearing machine. So there is a computer science sitting there, a computer sitting there. Uh, but that was mainly theoretical interest, you know, so not, I mean, theory is fine, you know. You know that unless you do an experiment and show something that what you can do, people don't get too much motivated. So finally, in 1994, uh, Edelman, while while reading a book on uh, you know uh, on molecular biology, uh, he realized that this DNA, RNA, protein, all these things you know he can uh, use some sort of computer science there, and he said uh, to his wife uh, Laura that uh, oh yes these things can compute, and then he planned an experiment uh, of solving a hematological path problem. Uh, you know you know that in computer science it's a very famous problem. And and he did an experiment within seven days, you know, without any training in biology. He learned everything, did the experiment, and that was a famous paper in science in 1994, you know. Uh, so that was the birth of DNA computing because you know, somebody has shown that you can solve a problem using a bunch of DNA strings uh, in the lab, right? So that was the birth of, uh, it's a very seminal paper uh, in 1994. And after that, uh, but that was more or less a trial and error. People, I mean, he has just done the experiment. And people thought that, okay. Trial is fine, but can we give a more formal mathematical, uh, you know, framework for this DNA computing? And then many, uh, as I told you, many uh, mathematicians jumped into this area and then they started developing the theory for it. And the first PhD, uh, was, uh, uh, in fact, I can say it was uh, uh, done by Eric Winfrey, who is now at Caltech, a professor in mathematics, computer science and biology. So he has done the first thesis in this area. 
I'll, I'll talk more about his work, how he came up with these ideas. Okay. So Edelman actually, after working in this area, he mentioned this quote, which I'm uh, reporting it, that biology and computer science, life and computation are related. And I am confident at their interface, great discoveries await those who seek them. It was a very powerful statement, actually. Uh, in fact, there are expeditions like Gregory Chatton, uh, who has said that entire ICT, whatever uh, you are learning in computer science or in communication, so ICT is a subset of biology only. Either that concept is already there in the biology or, uh, you know, yet to be discovered, you know, so it's, it's there in biology. So that's why biology is very rich. So, so that means if I want to understand about life or if I want to understand about the nature, I, I should know the computer science is very, very important. And not only computer science, I would say that even communication is also very, very important. Because computer science and uh, communication are two sides of the same coin. You know, uh, com in, in communication, we are sending information from one place to other place. And in computer science, basically, of course, uh, if we are storing the da data, so we are sending data, uh, information from now to then, you know, with respect to time. There are plenty of opportunities available. I'll, I'll show you a few of them uh, in the next couple of slides. So now first, uh, I would like to give you an outline of the story that ICT is everywhere, or, you know, philosophy of natural information processing. And what is philosophy of natural information processing? This is very, very important to build up exactly what, what we are going to talk about. So ICT, you know, uh, is consisting of IT, CT, uh, and, you know, so IT is information technology, that's the application layer, and mathematical root is computer science or machine, you know. So I think this, if you have done a course on uh, introduction to theoretical computer science, it will be really nice. Uh, you can do many, you can understand many concepts. And also similarly in communication technology, uh, that's the application layer. And mathematical root is theory of communication, information, and coding theory. Both of these areas are very, very important. And of course, the third part is also very, very important, uh, that realization of these things via logic gates and circuits. You know? So computation by circuits. So hardware, software, electronics, and VLSI semiconductor technology. You know, these are the important things. All these three components constitute what is known as ICT. Okay. It's a very, very fundamental area. And I think you know that. Uh, many of you are studying at ICT Institute, so you know what is ICT is, okay? So in this course, uh, basically when we say natural ICT, uh, so this course is all about foundation of natural ICT. What do you mean by natural ICT? In fact, you can think in three ways, you know, one, ICT or computation is inspired by nature. You know, so you look at the nature uh, around you and get an inspiration for an algorithm. You know, can you create a new algorithm out of it? And there are plenty of examples. In fact, many machine learning techniques are uh, coming from nature only. For example, artificial neural network, you know, so you observe the neural networks inside the brain and you came up with an artificial neural network, right? So many examples are there in machine learning. So people who are doing machine learning these days, they should know that if they want to create a new algorithm, they have to look at in the nature, you know, and see if there are new things. There are plenty of things available, you know. So I think we will learn a few things here. And of course, uh, I invite you to invent some new machine learning algorithms as well out of this. Okay. The second uh, aspect is ICT or computing by natural objects, which is bioengineering, synthetic biology, nanobiotechnology. So we are going to focus more on, more on the second part that uh, we build something out of it as an engineer. Okay. You observe the nature and you build something. So, you know, th uh, this is the key focus on, on of, our, of this course. And third portion is nature as ICT. So you understand the natural process. So basically, you know, uh, in the nature, things are, things are happening. Okay. And uh, uh, if you want to understand the nature, uh, how, what are the principles through which nature governs, you know, so that's the third part. Of course, all the three parts are very, very important, but we will be mainly focusing on the second part of this in this course. Okay. So what is computer? Uh, computer is a device which manipulates information, right? So that means processing means uh, storing and manipulation, right? So this is a very, very fundamental thing. And uh, okay. So representation of information in classical register is a bits, zero and one. 
and representational function in quantum computers is qubits you know smallest so i think quantum computers are very very important and many of you know that all the powerful companies right now for example amazon google microsoft ibm all of them are working on quantum computing uh, that's the next generation computer and i hope uh, in 5 to 10 years uh, of course right now it is available for you to access this computer but uh, you know it a more uh, affordable or more uh, you know right now you can access uh, this computer through for example ibm quizquet you know you can log in and you can you know, give your uh, program uh, in python uh, submit your program to the computer and the computer can solve it okay so we'll briefly touch about the quantum computation in this course uh, but of course uh, there are plenty of things to learn you know so what is the purpose of computing uh, purpose of computing is insight okay and not numbers this is a very famous quote by richard w hemming so computing is much more than you know just computing the numbers you know and what is communication so sending or receiving information from here to there you know this will requ also require information processing so you require a computer right so both of these are important aspects of ict now one can ask a very famous fundamental question what is information so representation of information is different in different information processing processes and machine and based on this we have digital information processing quantum information processing chemical information processing biological information processing structural information processing is uh, social information processing natural information processing you know so we are making a friend on facebook that's a computation process and you know if you understand the computation process maybe you can predict something you know any facebook network or any social network you can think uh, in terms of you know uh, a computational process you know this is very very important fundamental uh, you know so uh, i am not sure if you know that uh, that most of these social networks uh, you can uh, get inspiration from chemistry you know because there, there are a lot of interesting things uh, from that aspect which you can study okay in fact uh, if you want to study network of course there is a new uh, branch network science which also in a in a way it's part of natural ict but uh, you know we are not uh, discussing that in the course now what is information uh, or what is the difference between life and matter so people are saying is it information that is the difference so there is a uh, nice uh, review uh, by john casti in nature uh, you know creation life and how to make it you know and very important thing the, in the beginning uh, in the universe was information and then these codes were developed and so you know he, some people are saying that you as a physicist uh, you can think that information is a physical thing actually it's so very very important that uh, you think from that point of view uh, you know so information processing principles are very very important you know if you really want to understand the nature and i think uh, this is also very important uh, for machine learning people you know so now you see a new branch has uh, emerged which is highly interdisciplinary using computer science communication electrical engineering coding and information theory right so this is known as information processing in nature okay you want to understand information processing in nature you know and uh, when i say nature what i mean by nature i'll, I'll explain in a, in a minute uh, by a quotation by seth lloyd from mit uh, so you see that it requires mathematics biology chemistry physics nanotechnology medicine okay uh, it's highly interesting it's gold mine for science technology and business you know so set lloyd uh, at a mic he asked this question how systems of all kinds computers atoms brains cells societies and the universe as a whole process information this is a very very fundamental question you know if we understand how everything is processing information what are the principles i mean you may use machine learning techniques to find out these principles uh, but you know if you, it may be more mathematical also that you can really find a principle how things are working right uh, and in fact uh, you know as you know that uh, in the nature there are pretty interesting things are happening for example there is a benford law you know i i am not sure if you have heard about it but benford law is a very important law uh, you know which uh, predicts uh, the probability of uh, a digit d to appear in any data that you collect you know it's very very interesting thing you know so these laws are there and if you understand them then probably you can utilize them you can make some engineering uh, application out of it 
or you can make a product out of it. You know, a technology can be built around it. For example, the Belfort's law has been used for finding the tax fraud. People who do manipulation in, uh, in their tax filing that can be caught by Belfort's law tool. You know, so those things are possible. You know, so you learn something from the nature and try to build uh, technology around it. Okay, so. Now I'm going to uh, give you a, a story of uh, you know uh, nature, a very nice example, and you will see what I mean by information processing in the nature. You see, so one very fundamental thing that is happening. Yes, any question? So, if I ask you, 14 billion years ago, what happened? You know, so 14 billion years ago. Big Bang happened, right? So the original evolution of our universe. So essentially, uh, this is a process what is known as self-assembly of matter in space. And the self-assembly process is very, very important. Actually, self-assembly is nothing but a computational process. And uh, later on, I will show you that self-assembly of DNA in different form produces all four kinds of machines that are possible in computer science. That was shown by A. from Caltech. You know, so it's a very, very fundamental thing. That self-assembly is a fundamental thing. In fact, it is very common in the nature. For example, self-assembly in the formation of coral reef in the ocean. This is also a self-assembly process. Okay. Self-assembly of pigeons, you know. Uh, you might have seen this uh, at, uh, at many places, you know. Uh, I think uh, in Europe it is very common. The self-assembly of pigeons. Uh, but uh, our uh, question is, this is a process that we observe in the nature. Of course, it is a computational process, but can I control this process? That is the question, you know. So, for example, can I control these pigeons to write my name? Dr. Manish, you see, it is written, right, by these pigeons. So, self-assembly is a, you know, is a process, is, is a fundamental process in nature from macroscopic to microscopic and in between. So, can we control self-assembly process? Okay, or we can ask a question, can we self-assemble systems? Uh, which can be engineered can we make those kind of systems uh, in fact this course we will focus more on can we self assemble dna at our wish and so you know can we do dna computation and that's the question that we are going to answer and in, in variety of ways you can see how we can control dna you know and plenty of opportunities are available you know for you to control the dna okay uh, there is a Another book, famous book by Settler Light uh, from MIT, uh, Programming the Universe, a quantum computer scientist takes on the cosmos, right? And uh, you see a quotation that he has mentioned. I'm taking from this his book. Everything in the universe is made of bits, not chunks of stuff, but chunks of information, ones and zeros. Atoms and electrons are bits. Atomic collisions are operations. Machine language is the law of physics. The universe is a quantum computer. So this whole universe, you can think as a quantum computer. Why he's saying quantum computer? Because quantum computer is uh, is uh, is basically based on quantum physics, you know. So that is much more fundamental than the classical computer. Of course, see when you look at uh, any any system, you may find both quantum computers as well as classical computer in place. Uh, so all the, yes, uh, both both kind of comp computational processes are there. Any question? So there is information processing in human body, you know. Uh, this is a comparison with Intel Pentium 4, uh, you know, Intel Pentium 4. Total number of cells, genetic codes, and so on. Power consumption, how much in your brain actually. And uh, this is a couple of more details about the human brain. So of course, there's a lot of information processing inside the human body, and this is at, at a very general level. Uh, in fact, uh, I would say that if you look at inside our uh, human body, at plenty of places you will find different kind of computational process going on right from the chemistry, you know, because all these biochemical reactions are nothing but computational process, you know, they are computing something. So, so computer in, in a sense is, is, is a system which takes some input and produces some output. And this is the fundamental principle, right? In fact, what is thought? Thought itself is a computational process. This is a very famous book by Eric Bau. Uh, something around uh, you know, uh, 1997 or 98, he wrote this book, uh, Eric Baum. So uh, this book 
discusses that uh, how in the brain all the thoughts are nothing but a computational processes you know in fact uh, roser penrose and stuart hambrough uh, proposed quantum mind you know it's a very uh, so they they nice paper where they, they talk uh, it's talk about uh, penrose uh, penrose and hambrough model okay and uh, there they say that inside our brain the neuron there is a structure called microtubule and microtubule uh, the protein of the microtubule you know inside uh, you know uh, which could uh, be in two states alpha and beta so it acts as a qubit the smallest uh, qubit and so that's why we have the consciousness you know so we have the uh, consciousness because of quantum computer system inside our brain you know i i was lucky to meet both penrose and hambrough uh, back in 2003 in a quantum mind conference uh, you know so and I, I you know that penrose got a nobel prize uh, last year uh, you know so it's a very famous condition uh, but uh, so this is a nice way that the, our brain is of course there are some controversies also in this model people talk about different things but this is a very, very nice uh, idea and uh, you may also look at it you know these papers are available online you know so the quantum mind it's a penrose hamroff model you know that you can look at it so essentially uh, you know we have natural information processing so uh, there are plenty of branches that you can see of natural ICT, uh, natural computing, natural engineering, or call it synthetic biology, natural algorithms, communication, signal processing, natural logic gates and circuits, uh, molecular programming, uh, natural programming languages, natural networks. So complex networks is part of it. Natural storage, natural logic, natural robotics, uh, you know, robotics, natural security and cryptography, and natural coding and information theory. All these branches have emerged, uh, and uh, some work has some work is already there. So I think I will not be able to cover all of the stuff which is there, but I will cover a few things uh, in the course. And uh, of course, uh, but uh, sky is the limit, you know, if you want, uh, in, or if you have interest in some specific area out of these areas, you are free to do a project in that area and you can learn many things in there. okay? So there are some terms which are used uh, for this course otherwise unconventional computing, optical computing, of course, quantum computing is well established. Chemical computing, uh, not many people know about it. Uh, natural computing is a term. Uh, biologically inspired computing, some people also, but that's a different uh, application, all right? Then we have wetware computing. Uh, DNA computing is, of course, uh, one popular term. RNA computing, bacterial computing, molecular computing, amorphous computing, nano computing, okay? Billion ball computing, saw materials, morphological computing, liquid computing. You know, you can make computer out of liquid or water. This is something very, very, very important, you know. And uh, this deals with the, uh, you know, different kind of equations, you know. It's a very nice mathematical equations that can be, uh, that we'll discuss. I think if time is there, probably we'll cover uh, two, three lectures on liquid computing. Uh, you know, the peptide computing, membrane computing, uh, or protein computing, bacterial computing, ion computing. Now we have we, we people are talking about monkey computing, elephant computing, and pigeon computing. These these species can compute for you. You know they can do certain mathematical operations. You know of course you can train them to do to solve some mathematical problems. Okay, so now uh, any question at this point uh, before we move? Hello, any question? Okay, so how all this is started? Now I'll give you some brief history about uh, uh, computer science. So computer science essentially, you know, of course there are some different kind of things, but uh, okay, so there is a question, are there any prerequisites? Uh, uh, no, actually, uh, whatever prerequisite is there, I will cover in the course. Uh, in fact, uh, if you have done a course on theoretical computer science, it is very good. Uh, but uh, since we have some lectures available for you in those things, so uh, that's okay. So you don't have to, you know, really worry about it. Okay. Okay. So how all this is started? Uh,
Okay, in 1900, uh, it's a very famous year actually, you know, uh, in an international congress of mathematicians, uh, David Hilbert, you know, David Hilbert is a very famous mathematician. Uh, he, uh, you know, he pre presented 23 problems uh, and he said that mankind will remember him for these 23 problems. Some of them are still unsolved problem and they carry a prize of uh, worth $1 million, right? So one of the problem was uh, decision problem, uh, as you call in English. Whether there was a mechanical procedure by which the truth or falsity of any mathematical conjecture could be decided. And this question was asked by Hilbert because he was thinking that mathematicians were trying to prove many things. So is there any mechanical procedure uh, through which you can decide? So for example, Goldberg conjecture, you know, that every even number greater than four is sum of two prime numbers. You know, this is a mathematical conjecture. So can we uh, basically uh, find out uh, a mechanical procedure so that I can verify this <coughs> or I can uh, decide about it, you know. And so it turns out that uh, uh, this is not the case now. Now we know that the answer is no. Okay, we cannot do this. But uh, Alan Turing actually, he thought this mechanical, he misunderstood. And he thought that probably he's asking me, uh, us to make a machine. And he, he came up with the idea of Turing machine, which is a pen and uh, paper machine. And that resulted in, you know, uh, basically, you know, first uh, theoretical computer, you know, basically that's the birth of computer science. So Hilbert formalism idea, uh, that probably all mathematics follows from a system of exams and the exam system is consistent. Mathematics should be formulated as a solid logical foundation. Now we know it is not possible actually, you know. And here is a, a work of uh, Turing in 1936. He gave existence of a problem unsolved by mechanical means. Uh, and this is a very uh, famous problem, halting problem. He showed that halting problem is undecidable. You know? So uh, this was uh, important uh, discovery in the computer science. And in fact, later on, Noam Chomsky, who's a linguistic person, he classified that there are four kinds of machines possible. And this is a very, very important slide from a computer science point of view, that there are four kinds of machines, finite state automata, push down automata, linear body automata, and Turing machine. Each machine accepts certain kind of languages, recursive, enumerable, context sensitive, context free, and regular. And these languages have grammar. Actually, each language has a grammar, right? So, so basically, when we are looking into nature, we are looking at at what place, which kind of machine is sitting. As I mentioned to you in the early part of the lecture that Tom, Tom had actually uh, showed that, uh, you know, this splicing operation is Turing equivalent. So there is a Turing machine, uh, which is doing this splicing operation, right? So basically, uh, these kind of machines are everywhere inside human body, actually, you know, similarly, or I would say that these compression processes are there. Similarly, push down automata, finite state automata, these are these things have uh, plenty of applications in the real life anyway. But we are looking into the nature at what place these machines are there, right? So I was talking about Tom had, you know, so he showed the splicing operation on DNA, you know, is during equivalent. So this is a paper, okay. And uh, then I, uh, as I mentioned in 1994, Edelman solved an instance of NP complete problem, okay, uh, by molecular biology lab technique, right? So he, he did this experiment in seven days and he solved an instance of NP complete problem, a Hamiltonian plot problem or traveling salesman problem, right? So this is the important the milestone in the area of DNA computing. So this biomolecular computing can be divided. Uh, of course, there are many branches possible, but um, you know, mostly we can divide into five branches. Uh, membrane computing, mainly theoretical area, uh, you know, peptide computing or membrane computing, these, these are mainly theoretical areas. Then we have, uh, you know, uh, you know, RNA computing, uh, DNA computing, bacterial computing. So a lot of experiments uh, people are doing in these three areas. So these are important areas, you know. So of course, those who are interested in the pure theory, they can still look at the membrane computing and peptide computing. So normally uh, in our course, we don't get time to cover membrane computing or peptide computing because otherwise the course will be too big. Uh, so because uh, there is some experimental interest, so we focus on these three aspects, especially, you know, uh, bacterial computing, DNA computing, and RNA computing. And mainly uh, we focus on DNA computing actually, you know. 
you know, so that is uh, the key thing. So what is DNA computing? So when we do computation using DNA strands and DNA hybridization uh, is a main tool for DNA computing. You know? So this is something uh, very, very uh, fundamental thing, uh, you know. So basically in a classical computer, we have a computational problem, you know, and usually binary operations. And you know that problem is uh, converted into binary strings and it is solved. So the output is also in the form of binary strings zero and one. In DNA computing, uh, a computational problem is converted into a string of ACGT, and you know in the test tube we do the operations, okay, and uh, then output is also in the form of ACGT, okay. So this is a difference analogy between classical computer and uh, a DNA computer, you know. <coughs> now there are many emerging areas in DNA computing, and I think we work in most of these areas, so. DNA ties we will cover in this course, DNA nanostructures, how we can build this, DNA cryptography, DNA data storage systems. In fact, we have done a lot of work in this area. Uh, okay, DNA storage, DNA circuits, uh, you can you know make circuits out of DNA. And DNA is trend displacement is, is you know, it's also when in the industry, I, I call them dancing DNA, you know. So a bunch of DNA strands are dancing, interacting with each other and doing the computation for you. Beautiful area, you know, so DNA strand displacement, you know. So these are the major areas uh, and we will be focusing in most of them actually, you know, in the course. So you will learn more about uh, these things in the DNA computing. DNA storage, uh, as you know, uh, two gram of DNA can store entire internet, right? I, as I mentioned in the, in the line. And, uh, you know, this is a very, very important area. There are already about seven startups working in this area and, uh, you know, Microsoft has released the first prototype uh, of, of about $10,000. And uh, right now, um, I would say it's still emerging technology because they have stored, uh, they have written hello and retrieved it back in the DNA. And it took them about 21 hours, you know, to do this, you know. So basically, uh, you know, it's very, very early stage uh, where people are developing this technology. But of course, future is bright because that's how our, this computer started, you know. Uh, if you remember that, uh, in the early days, uh, you know, the first storage device was developed by IBM. It's a big, big, big machine, you know. But now we, we have uh, much more storage on our uh, iPhone or whatever common phone, right? So after the experiment by Edelman, Eric Winfrey came into picture, you know. So what he did, uh, in fact, uh, you know, there was already a well-developed area known as DNA nanotechnology with NetSimon was doing a lot of uh, experiments, you know. So he, uh, Ned Seaman is the, in his lab, he was doing trial and error to, for using, using DNA, he, he used to create a lot of nice nanostructures like, uh, you know, DNA cube, or DNA octahedron and those kind of things, you know, uh, by trial and error, all kind of things, you know, shapes from DNA. There's no algorithms there, you know. So Eric Winfrey actually uh, got the idea from Edelman, uh, you know, DNA computing, the idea of DNA computing from Edelman. And, uh, you know, when ties, uh, it's a theoretical concept, certain ties which can, uh, you know, uh, cover a space, you know, cover a rectangle or something. So, tiling business uh, was Turing Universal, and as Wang has shown in 1961. So, he took the idea of tiles from Wang tiles, hardware from uh, Ned Siemens lab, and the idea of DNA computation to, to uh, give a framework of what is known as algorithmic self-assembly. And as, as I told you, he has shown formally, in fact, we will cover that theory in the course, that uh, different uh, format of uh, self-assembly of DNA can give rise to different computing power of all the four machines that we discussed, you know. So, uh, you know, like uh, finite automata, push-down automata, or Turing machine, those kind of things uh, are possible. Uh, to do develop uh, using uh, algorithmic self assembly, you know, so self assembly of DNA can do give this by picking up the different hardware. You, you can arrive at this. In fact, uh, one of uh, students in your earlier classes has implemented the Eric Winfrey thesis. Now we have that uh, software with us, uh, which you can input and it will produce you, it will give you the uh, you know the corresponding DNA hardware which can be used to produce the particular language. You know. Nice work uh, done by some of uh, we take students of. Uh, your earlier seniors, you know. 
now i'm going to talk about some news headlines you know uh, some general things so what has happened in the area so dna computers plays a complete game of tic tac toe you know that has was that was done in 2006 DNA origami. Uh, so, using DNA, uh, Paul Rotman, as I mentioned to you, uh, created the uh, you know map of uh, USA. You know a lot of other shapes, interesting shapes, smiley face, and that came as a front cover of Nature. So very famous, you know. Now, DNA origami technique is uh, very popular and has a lot of applications in different uh, directions. You know, uh, you know, me medicine and other places. You can create uh, different kind of things using DNA origami. You know. So it's engineering, real engineering. The softwares are available for doing this. CAD Nano is one of them, and uh, you know there are many more things available. So you know in this what is called as scaffold DNA origami. You know, so these pictures are created uh, thanks to Paul Rotman who allowed me to use these pictures. You know. So this paper you can look at folding DNA to create nano scale shapes and patterns. You know. This is the main paper I was talking about. you can also work out dna origami counter you know so basically uh, this kind of counter can be created which can count so 1 2 3 4 5 and, you know in the real experiments uh, it, it does some mistakes but that's okay you know so of course you require error correction and that's where my expertise come you know in place you know because we work in error correction in any way any any technology As, you know people have also created program programmed the op, uh, opening of the box uh, leg you know a box is created and which you can open it you know by instructions from outside you know, using some sort of keys now this box can be used to put a drug molecule and transport it to a specific location inside the body so a lot of futuristic applications are possible this this paper appeared in 2009 in nature so ibm uh, uh, and paul rotman uh, you know they were working on a chip you know can we create a chip uh, using dna of course uh, there is a nice work by chris roy you know dna self assembled uh, systems so you can actually look at those things as well you know bacteria can uh, make computers uh, they can do calculations you know that uh, particular problem was solved by bacteria Uh, the period in general of biological engineering, you know, uh, so so these microbes can actually solve mathematical problems, you know. So this is a really interesting thing. This this was done in two thousand eight. Human visual uh, computing is possible, you know. So human visual system could uh, make powerful computer. Real ants were used to solve tower of Hanoi problem. This was again general of experimental biology. Uh, this appeared. So the tower of Hanoi problem, you remember, you, these disks are there. You have to transfer it to the third disk using the middle disk, such that uh, you know uh, no larger disk should come on the top of a smaller disk, right? If that principle is used, you need to transfer this. This is solved by the actual ants, you know. So we have developed a software, AntSoft, which you can use to create a configuration for solving a mathematical problem, you know. So this is a really interesting, interesting thing to do. uh dna sensors you know you can use uh, sensors you can create using dna which can you know you can create a, uh, a sensor for for example you know uh, water testing or many other things you know that is possible you know or for detecting a covid 19 for example uh, virus or whatever you know those kind of sensors are possible you can create those sensors you know, using dna origami uh dna computers in human cells that is also a possibility uh, you know uh, that was shown uh, okay robot dna robot was created so nano spiders independent walking robots made out of dna this was interesting discovery uh, you know so it was really shown in the lab you know dna circuits of 130 strands uh, used to calculate the square root you know you know so this was done by in the clinical lab at caltech so this is a uh, Nice thing, you know. You know, DNA is a good solver. Okay. Uh, circuits for DNA brains. So, uh, first artificial neural network created out of DNA. So, molecular soup exhibits brain-like behavior. So, I will quote again. It is brief. At last, we have a small test tube of over a hundred DNA strands playing games with you, trying to read your mind. 
acting like a lovely tiny brain. Tang okay. uh, at Harvard, uh, he's created uh, shapes of your DNA. You know, you can write using DNA, DNA you know, uh, in the lab, you know. And in fact, uh, motivated by this work, we created the software DNA pen, which can do this task automatically for you. So now anyone of you can do writing uh, using DNA. So this software was developed by mainly by Shikhar and the forum, Shikhar Gupta, who is now in Germany doing PhD. So Shikhar forum were the main people who developed this DNA pen, a tool for drawing on multiple canvas. Okay. So this is the software is available from our page. You can download it and you can you know use it for writing different things, you know. At the nano scale. You see the ohm is written, you know. And these strands are DNA strands which are hybridized with each other, you know, to form the structure, you know. So you write on the canvas and the things are created, you know. So Excel sheet is there, which will give you the DNA strands and which you, you know, the, you know, that can be sent to a, you know, any biotech company, which will give you the actual DNA strands, which can mix the lab. And then these things can be created and then you can use apoptical microphone AFM to take the pictures of these things. In fact, uh, Penguin further developed it uh, to 3D, uh, three dimensions, you know, call it DNA bricks. And we have developed a 3 DNA software out of it, you know. 3 DNA tool for DNA scripting, you know, which we developed. This is, uh, uh, you know, after developing, we have uh, the experimental uh, work was done by, you know, Dr. David Smith from Fraunhofer Institute in Germany. So, in fact, uh, both Shikhar and Forum spent time at uh, Fraunhofer after finishing this course. Yeah. There is uh, what is known as skin computing, you know. Skin can compute. Xylem uh, computing is possible. You know, Xylem is a slime mold which can solve. So, Andrew has done a lot of work in this area. A lot of books are available, you know. Uh, for maze solving, even in spatial simulation of road networks, logic gates, integration with electronics. So I think I will show you one video uh, from YouTube. Uh, and I think. Oh, visible. Yeah, so this is thanks to Andy, you know, uh, I'm using his uh, source uh, from the YouTube. Directly I'm playing it through. From YouTube, you know, so you can you see tracing the map. So these things are governed by the uh, food that you provide. You see how nicely, you know, the slime mold is moving. Okay, so this was a nice uh, picture. Anyway, now we have Wi Fi, you know, you, have, you, you heard about Wi Fi, but now we have. Wi-Fi, the biological internet, you know. This is uh, what do you indeed, you know. Mona Lisa, uh, you know, Mona Lisa is a famous picture, you know. Now you can create, uh, this was created by Caltech Lulu Kwan. At Caltech, they have created the nanoscale. This was also fan power of nature, actually. You know? Created the uh, Mona Lisa uh, at the lab, right? So I think that's all at this point. I will stop today. If you have any questions, I will take that questions and the rest of the things we'll do in the next class. Any questions at this point? I will we'll do more 
uh, overview and finally some literature in the next class. Any question at this point? Okay, what is to be done in the project? So project actually, uh, it depends. Either you can do theoretical work or you can do software kind of implementation of something, you know, or it all depends on your interest, entirely on your interest. Contribution type and the amount of contribution would depend on your interest, you know, how much interest you have. Based on that, you can pick up the project. Right? Yeah, in group. It, it can it will be done in a group yes in a group uh, you can do maybe two students uh, will be good enough normally two students an ideal one basically okay so i will probably uh, send an invite uh, to all the students for the google classroom if there is an issue you can handle it no problem So this these uh, this video is available online on, on YouTube as well, and I think uh, we'll be doing few more things uh, uh, in the next class. Uh, so please stay tuned, and uh, uh, you, you can subscribe to the channel, and so you know so that uh, you don't miss anything. And uh, this link is permanent, which I have sent you for the WebEx. This is a permanent link. You can always join the class using this permanent link. Okay. Any more questions? So in fact, uh, I should mention this. Uh, this is an interesting thing. That we have developed a software DMA, DNA Edge Pro. We will talk about these things, you know. Uh, what are the possibilities? OK, any more questions? Okay, thank you. So I will stop at this point and uh, we'll see you in the next class on Friday.